John the Revelator, before spending his final years on the Isle of Patmos, was the apostle to the church of Ephesus. There he taught two of his disciples, Ignatius and Polycarp. These and others carried the message of the beloved disciple for the next 200 years. John's first epistle illustrates his constant theme of the Father and his Son. The Son, the Word, is that eternal life which was with the Father. Our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, who is our advocate with the Father. We should continue in the Son and the Father. We have confidence in God and believe on the name of His Son. God sent His only begotten Son into the world. The Father sent the Son to be our Savior. God dwells in us if we confess that Jesus is the Son of God. We can overcome the world by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. God gave His Son. God has given us eternal life which is in His Son. These things have I written unto you, that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. The Father and Son are the true God and eternal life, that eternal life which was with the Father. Just as John had warned in his epistles about those who deny the Father and the Son, John's first disciple, Ignatius of Antioch, warned the believers in Trellis. Vain talkers and deceivers introduce God as a being unknown. They suppose Christ to be unbegotten. And as to the Spirit, they do not admit that He exists. Some of them say that the Son is a mere man, and that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are but the same person. Ignatius reported the loss of identity that was the result of Antichrist's teachings that made them either one person or one being. In contrast, Ignatius declared, as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, that the Father is the only true God, the unbegotten and unapproachable, the Lord of all, the Father and begetter of the only begotten Son. We have also a physician, the Lord our God, Jesus the Christ, the only begotten Son and Word, before time began. Another contemporary and disciple of the Apostle John introduced his epistle to the Philippians in the style of Paul's epistles. Polycarp and the elders with him to the Church of God, sojourning at Philippi, mercy to you and peace from God Almighty and from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, be multiplied. Justin Martyr was a Palestinian who became dissatisfied with Stoic and Platonic philosophy, accepted Christianity in Ephesus, and wrote extensively to defend it. In his dialogue with Trifo, written about 45 years after the death of John, Justin attempts to persuade a Jew from Scripture that Jesus is the divine Son of God, the promised Messiah. God beget before all creatures a beginning, a certain rational power proceeding from himself, who is called the Holy Spirit, now the glory of the Lord, now the Son, again wisdom, again an angel, then God, and then Lord and Logos. He was begotten of the Father. Justin then quotes Proverbs 8. When he speaks by Solomon, the Lord made me the beginning of his ways, for his works. From everlasting he established me in the beginning, before he had made the earth, and before he had made the deeps, before the springs of the waters had issued forth, before the mountains had been established, before all the hills he begets me. But this offspring, which is truly brought forth from the Father, was with the Father, before all the creatures, and the Father communed with him, even as the scripture by Solomon has made clear, that he whom Solomon calls wisdom was begotten as a beginning before all his creatures and as offspring by God. Justin quotes Psalm 110, a verse also quoted by Jesus, Peter, and Paul, each applying it 
to the Son of God. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. He shall send forth a rod of power over Jerusalem, and it shall rule in the midst of thine enemies, in the splendor of the saints. Before the morning star have I begotten thee, from the womb of the morning. Justin also saw in the stone cut from the mountain in Daniel 2, a symbol of the Son of God. And the same thing he proclaimed in a mystery when he speaks of this stone which was cut out without hands, signify that it is not a work of man, but of the will of the Father and God of all things who brought him forth. About 10 years later, he wrote his first apology to the Roman Emperor Antonimus in defense of Christianity. Jesus the Christ is the Son of God, and his apostle, being of old, the Word, and appearing sometimes in the form of fire, and sometimes in the likeness of angels, but now, by the will of God, having become man for the human race. The Father of the universe has a Son, who also, being the first begotten Word of God, is even God. For Justin, the deity of Christ is assured by his divine inheritance from the God of the universe. Tertullian, another prolific Christian author, was born in Carthage, North Africa, about the time Justin Martyr died. In his book, Against Praxis, Tertullian also used Proverbs 8 to support the pre-existence of Christ. Listen, therefore, to wisdom expressed in the character of the second person. At the first, the Lord created me as the beginning of his ways with a view to his own works, before he made the earth, before the mountains were settled. Moreover, before all the hills did he beget me. This is to say, he created and generated me in his own intelligence. Other English translations render created as generated or begotten, but Tertullian makes it clear he was begotten, not created. By proceeding from him, God, he became his first begotten son, because he was begotten before all things, and he was also his only begotten, because he alone was begotten of God, in a way unique to himself, from the womb of his own heart. Even as the Father himself testifies, my heart, he says, has emitted my most excellent word. Thus Christ is Spirit of Spirit, and God of God, as light of light is kindled. Like Justin Martyr, Tertullian also understood the concept of divine inheritance. That which has come forth out of God is at once God, and the Son of God and the two are one. In this way also he is Spirit of Spirit and God of God. He is made a second in manner of existence, in position, not in nature. He clearly presented a two-being subordinate Christology persisting well into the third century AD. Tertullian also saw in the creation of man a type of the Father and Son. In this work, he makes a point of how significant the one rib from Adam produced two and no more. There were more ribs in Adam, but not more wives in the eye of God. Accordingly, the man of God, Adam, and the woman of God, Eve, sanctioned for mankind a type by the authoritative precedent of their origin. Tertullian notes that God made man in his own image by creating only two, not three, which was based on the authoritative precedent of the Father and the Son. How will a woman have room for another husband? She will have one in spirit, one in flesh. This will be adultery, the conscious affection of one woman for two men. This seems to describe the duality which exists if Christ and the Holy Spirit are two separate persons. The church now has two husbands, two intercessors, two mediators, one in spirit, one in flesh. 
She then tries to give her conscious affection for two men, and this will be adultery. Two is company, three's a crowd. Novation was a Roman priest who argued that the church could not forgive sins, but only God. His treatise on the Trinity, written in 257 AD, nearly 70 years before the Council of Nicaea, was aimed at refuting the modal God of the Sibelians. His argument is based on the divinely begotten Son of God. There is then God the Father, who established and created all things, who alone is without origin, invisible, boundless, immortal, eternal, the one God. To his greatness, his majesty, his powers alike, nothing whatever can be placed. I will not say in superiority, but even in comparison. From him, at such a time as he, the Father, willed the Word, who is the Son, was born the Word, acknowledged as the personal substance of a power issuing forth from God. Ignatius, Justin, Tertullian, Novation, all believed in the begotten Son who came forth from God. The Son has his origin in the Father, who has no origin. He proceeded from the Father, at whose will all things were made. God, assuredly, proceeding from God, constituting the second person after the Father, as Son, yet not robbing the Father of the unity of the Godhead. If he had not been begotten, he would have been ranked with him who is not begotten, and the two, being found to be equal as unbegotten, would of course have given us two gods. He is begotten. For whether he is the word, whether he is power, whether he is wisdom, whether he is light, whether he is the sun, whatever he is of these, he has no other source of his being, as we have said before, than the Father. He owes his origin to the Father, for he derived his origin in being born, from him who is the one God. Novation's words are rich with the words of Scripture. Jesus said, I proceeded forth and came from God. I live by the Father. I came out of God. I came forth from the Father. He that is of God hears God's words. I am the Son of God. I am in the Father and the Father in me. For over 200 years, belief in the begotten Son of God remained the faith once delivered to the saints.